I just loved the game so much when I was younger and you know, I happened to be pretty good at it. And so as I got older, I, I joined more and more um, elite youth club teams. I played at a high level high school and then I ended up playing um, for two years at the University of Florida and, and, uh, and then three years um, here in Minnesota. And so, um, and what happened for me over that time was I always kind of had in my head, you know, I'm, I want to be a professional soccer player. And then I was like, well, I was conscious of the idea that, well, um, soccer careers, athletic careers kind of end earlier than most. And, and so I'll need a, I'll need a plan B. I'll need a second career after that. And so it was just as a young kid who's just so in love with this game, I was like, okay, well, so then I'll, then I'll just be a coach. Um, and that was how that idea of coaching started and got into my head. And then I went to um, university, you know, university and studied sports psychology. I set up my academics around the idea of coaching uh, because I knew that's what I wanted to get into. And as I was taking this first sports psych course um, and learning about kind of best practices for optimal performance or for you know for positive experiences through sport. Um, <coughs> it started to hit me and all these memories and stories of my own playing days uh, growing up or, or, you know, currently in college, how some of these things that I was learning about, about best teaching practice or best group dynamic practice, um, optimal, how to cultivate optimal performance, weren't, sometimes they would line up with what I experienced as an athlete and sometimes they wouldn't. And so that really kind of sparked that curiosity for me of like, Oh, coaching is an is, a, is an art and it's a science. And how do we how do we show up and coach? Um, you know, informed by this by informed by this science. And so I continue learning about psychology and kinesiology and physiology and throughout my my undergraduate experience. And and eventually I found my way to youth work. Um, and I started to see coaching through a youth work lens. Um, and really just kind of um, analyzing and, and reliving the stories and memories of my playing experiences um, and, and then reading those experiences through that, that youth work lens of what I'm learning in my youth work coursework and, and how, and then just constantly um, as a player when I'm at practice and then, right, because I was, so as a student athlete still my last year of, of um, graduate school, so I was playing I was coaching on the side and then I was studying. Um, so all of these things in tandem allowed me to just constantly be analyzing and refining and learning um, and questioning, really just always questioning and searching for, for more knowledge around the idea of like, how do we as coaches um, influence young people? How do we develop young people? How do we create healthy environments? Um, for young people to learn about themselves and about others and about the community and the world at large. Um, and, and there's, you know, if you look at the statistics, um, more young people play, play sport, um, than any other outside of school activity. There's like 45 million kids who, who engage in sport in the United States. Um, and so, so coaches have such a fantastic youth work opportunity. Um, and, and, I just really began to question and, and wonder, like, how many coaches think about coaching as youth work? Um, do we think about coaching as uh, purely about about executing physical skills and about winning, or do we think about it as an opportunity to mentor? Um, and how how would kids' experiences shift? How would um, sport environments shift, how would the relationships between adults and young people shift if we did think about it from a youth work perspective. Uh, so really just all of these questions um, through my coursework and my playing experience began to kind of grow on my mind and and so I couldn't I couldn't get away from it, I couldn't get enough of it and I, I just kind of couldn't help myself but pursue coaching um, and pursue the idea that and take on the identity and and um, idea that I am a youth work coach and I want to execute my job as a youth work coach. And what does that mean? You know, right now I coach at various different levels. I've coached anywhere from five five year olds to uh, through through college. Um, 
and I, I really just eat it up and love it every day. And, and I'm always thinking about um, how do I show up in a moral, morally responsible, socially responsible way with these young people and how do we together, me and the young people together, craft and create um, our environment that helps us both grow and learn. Um, I've learned from student athletes over a lot of years that sports are different, which I guess shouldn't surprise anybody who plays, but does kind of surprise me. That, sure. And, and so basketball players have, have definite attitudes about football players <laughs> and swimmers sure. and soccer players. And, and people can describe for me that it's a whole different mindset in a different sport. Can you tell us about soccer, and what what's what's distinctive about soccer for for a player? Yeah, gosh, yeah, I love different sports. Certainly have different unique um, characteristics and different cultures, and um, and I can tell you about about soccer. But I think even within that, my my niche world is is girls soccer, women's soccer, and so I'll explore that probably more in depth. Um, so there's a, there's a few different unique things um, with soccer, and I guess I'll start with the idea that um, it's a free-flowing game, right? So there's no, um, contrary to, to, for example, your football, there's no kind of like succession of set plays. And, um, and there's also no timeouts. And so I think for, for me as a, as a as a youth work coach, from that perspective, what that does is it really hands over the ownership and the decision making in those moments to the players, um, to the young people. Uh, and sometimes, right, um, when I go to when I go coach at tournaments, you know, there's a lot of big, massive field complexes where there's just games going on everywhere. And so, a lot of times in those situations, what I like to do is to to watch coaches and see how they. Um, how they carry themselves or how they embody um, the role of coach on the sideline. And, and there's some coaches, you see them almost kind of like acting as puppeteers, right? So they're trying to, um, they're trying to make the decisions for their players in real time on the field. <laughs> or, or I've heard it described as kind of like joystick coaching. So it's almost like you're playing a video game and you can, you can kind of will the players to move exactly where you want. Um, and, and, that to me is fascinating because what I've noticed young people, players do um, as a reaction to that is it, it almost is like you can visually see them almost turn their own brains off and instead of critically thinking for themselves and solving problems and making decisions for themselves, they start to think, what does that coach want me to do? Um, and I've, I've seen players in the middle of a game in real time when the ball is right there around them instead of focusing on the ball and their teammates they i've seen players physically turn their heads to their coach and say what like what do you want me to do right um so to me that's fascinating right because from from a youth work perspective um games are opportunities where where the kids go out there and they they make decisions and they try things and they explore and they experiment on their own and that's their chance to give it a try and if it works great they learned that it worked and if it doesn't work well great they've learned that that doesn't work and maybe they can try something new next time or we can have a conversation about perhaps why that didn't work and what approaches we could take differently next time right it becomes a learning um opportunity uh and, and so for me, games are these wonderful moments of like experimentation for kids to go and try. Um, and that's, you know, games are my moments where I, I, I'll have conversations with players on the sideline around like, hey, did you notice what they tried there? Did you notice how it, it worked? And here's, and why do you think that might be? And did you notice maybe it, it didn't work so well? And maybe what could they do differently, right? So games are moments to like explore and, and interrogate those decision-making critical thinking moments for young people but they're not moments from, from my youth work coaching perspective games are not moments for me to to control and to to puppeteer my players right i think that defeats the purpose and it negates the whole um the whole critical thinking and decision making potential of sport 
right? So if all I'm ever doing is telling my players exactly what to do and how to do it, and then um, demanding that they go out on the field um, and do exactly what I say, then I am uh, effectively like, you know, authoritarian dictator, like asking for and demanding compliance. Um, but if I use games as moments to like invite my players to think for themselves um, and to engage their own, their own sense of like, uh, of real time uh, decision making, then games become, become moments of learning and growth for players. So think, I think that's a really fascinating um, dynamic of soccer specifically that, that I love about the game. Um, and there's no, right, I, I was just having this conversation with a player uh, yesterday. Um, in soccer, there is no right way to do a thing, right? There's just multiple different options, and we just have to engage critically and think about what what is potentially the best, or, or perhaps there isn't a best, but a good option or good decision to make here in this moment, in any given moment. Um, so that, that lack of set plays really provides um, like a, a blank canvas for players to um, to explore their creativity and and uh, and to explore their own sense of, of how they read and imagine the game. Um, on uh, on another on another level, um, soccer to me is uh, fantastically beautiful um, because it is not just. Um, a game that is played in America. It's not just a game that's played in, in one country or another. Um, it is a universal world worldwide game. And I know I know from my own experience, um, I've, you know, showed up at, uh, in futsal courts or at pickup fields. Um, and I can just I can hop on the field and play and, and potentially no one. I don't even speak the same language as other people there. But um, I think what's really fascinating and beautiful to me is that it's almost like the game becomes a language, right? We can speak through the ball and, and um, you know, when I get, when I show up at a pickup field um, and someone passes me the ball, that's, that's in a sense, it, it's in a sense, it's the language of invitation and welcome, you know, it's welcoming me to the space. Um, and in a lot of ways I feel, you know, I feel like when, um, someone passes me, the, make a run up the sidelines and someone passes me the ball, um, that pass communicates trust. You know, they trust me to, to take care of the ball for our team or they trust what, my ability and what I can do. Um, so, so I think soccer specifically as a sport has this um, ability to welcome um, and bring together people of different um, social backgrounds, people of different nationalities, different cultures, um, who speak different languages and and um, that I think is fascinating for me. Um, but but when I read girls and women's soccer specifically in the United States, um, and this is something I've been thinking about and exploring a lot more recently, it's uh, those different pockets and spaces of play don't often intermix and come together, right? So for example. Um, there, I, I, since, you know, living here in Minnesota, I've been invited to play um, in a Latina league on Sundays. And I show up, and um, it's a beautiful, wonderful uh, community of, of Latina women who get together and play. Um, I've been invited to um, play in uh, among leagues. So last summer I played in among festival, among tournament, um, and it was a fantastic, beautiful space where Hmong people got together and play. Um, I coach in St. Paul, and a lot of the girls that I coach are, are Karen, and they form their own um, Karen women's leagues, and they coach their own teams, and it's beautiful and wonderful. Um, and then it, when you venture, you know, more away from the city and into the suburbs, um, there's a lot of uh, suburban club teams, um, and those spaces are often predominantly predominantly white spaces and, and you know, suburban white uh, girls soccer. Um, and, and I think something that I'm interested in exploring is how do we, um, 
how do we envision soccer as like a third space, like a social space where um, different people of different backgrounds can come together um, and speak this common language of the ball and, and through that, like get to know each other a little, a little better and what is the power in that? Um, you know, I, I would argue that just kind of in our daily lives, those, those spaces don't happen so much anymore where um, we meet in a, in a public, common public space with, with people of different um, experience and background than us. And, and I'd argue that sport can, and, so, and, and that, so, that sport and that soccer specifically can be a really beautiful space for that. But only if we, if we um, think, if only if we act intentionally and think of soccer as that space and then like intentionally make those, those things happen. Um, but for example, this, this past season, um, coaching at Como, uh, you know, a good chunk of my team is, is a Kren girls, a good chunk of my team, um, a couple of Latina girls, I had a couple white girls. And at the end of the season, we, we met in a circle and I had them think on and reflect for a few moments, just the idea of like, what, what did this season mean to you? And um, came to this one young woman on our team, uh, her name is Ruby, and, and she said, coming into the season, I thought the season was going to be about me getting better as a soccer player. And then she said, and, and I did do that, but really um, what this season was about was meeting new people and making new friends. Um, and that was like so touching and meaningful for me because um, that soccer team is a is a is a really diverse group, a really diverse small community, like a, a microcosm right of our city, and um, and I don't think the girls on that team would have ever met, and they certainly wouldn't have reached I think the depth of relationship that they did had it not been um, for that soccer experience. So that's really special to me. Um, that, that girl Ruby, um, you know, she's, um, lives more towards the suburbs from a white family. And there's another girl on her team, uh, Monday, and she's a Karen refugee and, you know, has, it just, is just learning English and, um, and, but they're both beautiful, amazing young women and with, with a great sense of humor. And they became really, really close, um, really, you know, really good friends. And, um, one day I heard them talking as we were heading towards the field and um, Monday was like, hey, hey, what'd you have for lunch? And Ruby was like, well, you know, I had some pasta and some watermelon that my mom packed for me. Um, and Ruby was like, hey, uh, what did you have for lunch? And Monday was like, uh, I had the school tacos. And right, and it's just this very different um, world of like, hey, my mom packed my lunch versus like, I'm on free and reduced lunch from the school. Um, so this mixing of like, of like economic class and, and, um, you know, ethnic and social background. Um, but yet they're like having this wonderful conversation where they're talking about, you know, just a simple thing that they ate for lunch and they're finding, um, friendship and commonality through that. So, so for me, um, soccer is really great from a, like a decision making standpoint because it's so free flowing. And it also has this wonderful potential to like explore um, and to to explore different people of different backgrounds through the common language of the game and to bring pe people of different backgrounds together through like this common love of the game. So I w what I wasn't quite understanding what you just said was how much you think that potential to bring people together gets realized in, in women's soccer. Yeah. I mean, it sounds like for you, sure. it's gotten realized a lot. You've crossed all kinds of boundaries. Yeah. And it sounds like in the team you're coaching, it's getting realized. Mm -hmm. But uh, is, it get, is it generally, is, it, is, is women's soccer generally that kind of a space? No. So that's a great question. I'm glad that you asked it. And, and my... My general sense um, is that no, it is not generally that kind of a space, um, and and uh, here's why, right? So, um, in the in the rest of the world, soccer is is generally um, a pretty ac accessible, low cost sport. Really, you know, if you if you bring soccer down to its bare bones, really all that you need is a some kind of playing surface and a and a ball. Um, 
you sp uh, meanwhile, right, in, you know, in the United States, um, youth sport has become a billion dollar industry, right? Billion with a B. And so there's this whole pay for play system for youth sport, right? Um, and and it, it involves, there's a pay for play system for youth sport that then feeds into college athletics. So kind of youth sport is a funnel into being a college student athlete. Um, and so I'll, I'll use the example of women's soccer because that's what I know, that's my world. Um, if, if you wanna play college women's, women's soccer right now, um, then you need to be recruited. Okay, well, how do you get recruited? Um, coaches recruit at club, club soccer events. So they'll go to, to games, they'll go to tournaments um, and sit on the sidelines and watch. And, um, okay, and so what is club soccer? Well, um, there's, there's these clubs that, you know, coaches gather and, and um, families and players come and they pay money to be a part of these clubs, to get these, this training from the coaches, to be a part of these leagues, to go to these tournaments. Um, girls club soccer is, is very expensive. Um, it's, it costs thousands of dollars a year to be on a, a girls youth club soccer team. And then thousands of dollars a year plus, plus um, your parents have to be able to devote the time to transport you to practice. They have to have a car to transport you to practice. They have to have money to pay for the gas to practice. Um, you need to be able to afford cleats and shin guards. There's all these added costs. Youth, youth sport, youth soccer, girls youth soccer specifically gets very costly. Um, and often these clubs are, are based out of suburbs. Um, not always, but often. And so, um, right, right, economic class and, and race get, you know, are, are, are intertwined and intersectional, um, you know, in America. And so, and so is, right, uh, geographic location. And so often these youth girls club soccer organizations, um, are out of suburbs they're costly and um, they're based out of predominantly white areas. And so um, often lower income girls who live in the city, girls of color uh, and um, you know wealthier girls who live in suburbs who are predominantly white, they play in really different spaces. So suburban girls play on club teams. Um, Often these lower income city girls, girls of color, and obviously all of those things don't always go together, right? But, but often they do. Um, they can't afford club soccer, and so they create their own leagues, the Latino League. They create the Karen League. They create the Hmong teams. Um, despite all of the barriers that are set up in this, this youth sport pay-for-play system, um, despite all of those barriers, they they create their own game regardless. Um, and that's really cool and beautiful to me, right? They, they love it so much that they, they um, kind of create their own incarnation of the game. Um, and, uh, and so the interesting thing um, is that when colleges are recruiting, they only go to these suburban club teams. They only, and if they go to any high school matches, they only, you know, only really generally and predominantly go to high school, uh, high schools in, in suburbs. And so what's happening is girls who play in the city on their own teams in their own tournaments that they've organized themselves, um, they're outside of this funnel into college sport and um and the system of youth sport the system of pay for play doesn't even know that they exist um they are those girls despite their skill and love for the game and their validity and legitimacy as real people and players they are invisible to the system um of of the mainstream system of girls youth sport and soccer um which i think is um uh, 
through my own experience of getting to know girls who play in the city, it's it's pretty tragic because these girls have, have love to play and they have dreams of playing in college and they have dreams of being a professional and yet um, they don't have that same opportunity to realize those dreams as I did strictly because of where they live and their income level and what they look like. Um, and the only reason that I have gotten a snapshot into this uh, right, so I grew up in this suburban world. Um, I grew up playing on elite youth club teams, and then I played college soccer. And I did, had no clue that this other world existed at all. Um, and the only reason that I have learned about it um, and been able to to like enter those spaces, and now I'm you know, I, I feel in many ways an accepted member of a lot of those spaces. Um, the only reason that's been possible for me. Um, is because I got this job coaching at Como Park High School in St. Paul. Um, and Como Park is a, is a pretty unique high school. Um, it, you know, it's very diverse. And so um, I, uh, through, through meeting, you know, the, for my first day ever at Como Park, I had the, you know, one of the coaches who'd been there previously told me that a lot of the girls didn't play club. And so in my head, I'm like, okay, if they don't play club maybe they you know I couldn't I couldn't imagine that there was any spaces that they did play other than high school or club soccer and so when I showed up on day one and I was like oh these girls are really good they've got great skills I was like racking my it didn't make any sense to me I couldn't under understand or comprehend how they got to be good at soccer how they developed these skills if they didn't play club um it was like where where could they possibly be playing if not club soccer um because I didn't, I, I couldn't, I, I grew up in, in the white suburban world and I couldn't understand, I had no concept that these other spaces existed. And so slowly through these relationships with these, with these girls, I learned, um, oh, they, they play on their own Kren team. Oh, they play in their own Kren leagues. Um, and then from, from that moment on, that like first kind of like light bulb of understanding that there are other girls soccer spaces that I never knew about and never knew existed and then I intentionally um began to to seek out those spaces and that is how I have um found myself you know walking in both worlds and found myself um you know a member of of both worlds and and now um that's why I'm I'm hoping and trying to take on um this new this new kind of challenge or, or experiment or idea of like how can we mix those worlds and bring them together um so for example right now i'm coaching at a club um out out in the suburbs and i'm still coaching those girls in st paul city and i'm i'm really trying to brainstorm and find ways to bring those two groups of girls together to play um because they they have that common love and language of the game um but in a lot of ways they have really different backgrounds and i think if they just get to know each other through the game and learn about one another um it could be really a really cool and amazing experience um just like me learning about these these um girl soccer spaces that i didn't know about before has been really cool and amazing uh, for me well as somebody who didn't have kids playing soccer and never played it myself and in any case my my athletic context is from high school in the 60s which is a different game yeah uh, I guess gotta get straight how it is for these kids so they're playing like for you yeah you're playing on a high school team mm -hmm. right yeah but then you are also doing the club thing yes. parallel yes and how many hours a week were you playing between you know during during season yeah um gosh every 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 day i mean if i had a day off from soccer it was rare um and how many hours at best day? it was a one one hour off a day and um and so it was generally you know probably two hours a day um but then as i got older i would add on to that lifting or or conditioning um so uh at most um 
should be able to put in maybe like a five hour day or, or if you go to camps over the summer those are, are literally all day long it's a six hour day um but but yeah so for high school season you know it'd be two hours of practice every day after school practice on weekends um and games and then throughout the winter it would be indoor practices practices in gyms and in domes on ter indoor turf fields um and then in the spring it's it's practice uh, outdoors on grass every day for your club team and then throughout the summer um i went to so summer soccer camps ev every single week and so that was every week of the summer like you know six hours a day of of soccer uh and then when you get to college um you're technically <laughs> In season, you're given like 20 hours a week that you're allowed to to devote to soccer. Off season is a little bit less. Um, but then when you factor in, when you're in college, when you factor in things like travel time or commute time to and from games and practices and things like that, you know, it's it's much more than. And when you factor in, sometimes lifts go longer than you think or or you know we're always doing extra practice on our own or when you factor in um uh, uh regeneration and and rehab time from injuries and things like that we're we're putting in much more than 20 hours a week uh devoted towards being a soccer player so is it fair to say that from the time you started in high school there an average of 10 hours a week through the year would be reasonable yeah, yeah, an average of 10 hours a week, uh, at the at minimum, I would say. And then when you got to college, that went up to something like 25 hours a week? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's fair to say. There were certainly down weeks, you know, after the season ended, we would get about two weeks off, and I would really try to use that time to take a mental break and a physical break, and... Um, but on average, yeah. through the year, 20, I mean, let's drop it down to 20. Yeah. Through the year, 20 hours a week? Reasonable? I, I think that's, I think that's a fair and reasonable thing to say, yeah. Especially if you include things like, you know, watching video or, um, or doing any kind of rehab or body, body regeneration work, stretching and whatnot. Yeah, absolutely. And now, I also want to get the picture of how this club thing works. In sure. other words, if you're taking if you're a high school soccer player and you did it the way I went out for wrestling, which is you go, you practice when the wrestling team practices, and then you go home and you forget about it. Uh, you got, you know, however many hours there is are a week during the it what does the club stuff like double that or yeah, so um, generally, high school season is generally like three months. Uh -huh. Club doesn't generally do anything during those three months, but oh, club see. will operate the rest of the year. Okay, so it's, it allows you to play soccer year-round. Yes. Whereas the high school will only invest in soccer. For three months. Three months, and then Correct. otherwise. Is there anything, any way within the high school system, if you don't have money for club stuff, is there any way to keep going uh, for you know in some way over the rest of the year? Not through not through your high school, no. Um, unless <laughs> unless you have some kind of really spectacular high school coach. So for example, at Como Park, the varsity high school coach, um, who is only paid for the three months of the season, takes his own time just because he he cares and and wants to be there for the girls to show up at the he he reserves time at the school gym to um to provide opportunities for the girls to play futsal so um generally no there's the high school will not provide any playing opportunities other than those kind of three months of high school sports season um so yeah. these uh you know latina leagues and current leagues and so forth. Yeah. These are things that got organized by the, I mean, how do these things get organized? I mean, I take it they're doing the same job as the club, yeah. right? right? Allowing girls to play full year. Yes, exactly. And, and, and to, to, to develop their skills with that level. Yeah. Uh, 
so so how do how do they get organized? Where do they come from? Yeah, so um the best that I can tell, the the Karen girls largely organize their own league. They um they form and and often coach their own teams. Occasionally they'll get um an a, an older person from the community to coach. Um Often it's, you know, an older brother or something like that. I've seen that happen. Or, um, and so they, they largely form and organize their own teams and leagues on their own. And then, right, there's no... The, the kind of, like, lived experience of the structure of that is very different than your club world because, like, for club, like, there'll be an email chain and a group... Um, a group app where they can all communicate and there will be a website that everyone can go to to check the schedule and then college coaches can go to that website to check the schedule. For the Karen League, um, it's very much spread through word of mouth. Be at the field at this time. Um, or it's often a lot communicated via Facebook Messenger. Um, and so that that league and that world is just is every bit as real but the ways in which it exists like, you know, when it when it's not physically happening, um, look different and feel different, uh, and so it's it's right. It's not it's not visible if you Google search it, um, and then you know similar similarly for uh, the Latina League that um, that one is um, a bit more organized by the community as a whole. There's there's um, community members who rent out the gym space and, and contract the referees and those teams more often have have um, coaches but they're not formalized coaches the coaches are not paid they're just like community members who care about the game or they're um, or there are people who you know older women who used to play on the team and now they're older and they want to coach or the team that I play on is um, one of our teammates uh, her husband is the coach um, and again it's not he's not it's not his job he's not paid for that it's just something that he loves to do and so he provides um, that role of coach for us versus we're right in the club world the coach is is paid that is that person's job um, and again for the Latino League that there is not really like an online space where that exists I find out about when and where my games are because I get a I mean our games are on Sundays I get a text message Friday evening saying hey we're at you know Green Central Middle School at 8 p.m. Um, and so uh, as it, you know they both have structure and and they're they're both real leagues they're just organized and and um, run differently um, and then the Hmong, the Hmong tournament is similar. Again, it's a lot communicated through like a Facebook event or, or through word of mouth. Um, yeah. So, so let's see. Now, my guess is that the, 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 the clubs where people are pay, you know, paying a lot of money to make it happen, those kids are getting at least a certain amount more playing time and they're also bumping up against some some, some better players right I mean, that's what the money is sure. about right yeah 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 so some um club soccer uh yeah you're <sighs> I don't know. I don't know if I would say that you're necessarily give, getting more playing time with club soccer because a lot of what, like, um, the city soccer looks like, or a lot of what, um, you know, there's there's Latina leagues, like, almost every day of the week if you want to play. Or, like, a lot of times, if you go to a lot of rec centers in St. Paul throughout the winter, there's just, there's, there's current kids there playing pickup. So... It's not necessarily more playing time, it's just the way that that play looks is different, right? So if you go to a club, it's a lot more structured by the adult. There's, um, there's set drills that we do, there's passing lines, There you're going to learn this foot skill today, we're going to do this act set activity that I'm setting up with cones. If you go to a rec center in St. Paul in the winter, it's free-flowing pickup play. And... So those environments are really, really 
different. They're not, I wouldn't necessarily say one is better than the other, but they're different. And if you spend all of your time in, in a structured environment versus a free flowing play environment, you're going to, you know, after years and years of spending time there, you're going to end up being a, di a different player that has slightly different strengths or reads the game slightly differently. Um, so in terms of time playing, I don't know if it's necessarily um, different. What was your other question? I'm just, just trying, I guess what I'm trying to get at is... Oh, level of play? Level of play. Sure, yeah. Um, I think that the common way of reading the level of play is that the club level of play is much, much, much higher. And to a certain extent, the idea that club level of play is higher, um, right, it has some validity and, tr and truth to it. But I think that there's also a, a way to read that dynamic where um, the club level isn't necessarily a higher level of play. It's just that the way that club soccer looks is what we value in America and what we read as like good soccer. Um, it's a lot of, when you watch suburban soccer, it's, um, it's very athletic, it's it's physical, girls can kick the ball far, they can run fast. Um, and then if you watch, um, for example, kids who grew up playing pickup in small rec centers in the winter, um, just by nature of that environment, like, it's a small space and there's a lot of kids, so those kids have to become really good with their feet. They have to have really quick feet and be able to move the ball through tight spaces. And so a lot of times that environment will create kids who are really technical on the ball and um, uh, who move quickly in, in tight spaces, but they're not necessarily really big and physical or they don't necessarily run straight down the field really fast because if you're in a small gym and you just run straight down the field really fast, really you try to kick the ball far and run after it, well, then you run into a wall in 10 feet, right? But the the type of play that that kind of city rec environment creates, I don't think that we read that as, as real and valuable um, in our in in our current incarnation of the of the women's youth sports system, just because often we don't even know that this world exists, and so we think this is the only way of being, and we imagine that this is the best way of doing soccer, as opposed to imagining that there are multiple different ways of being and, and playing soccer, and that they all have value. Um, so I think that's a long way to winded way to answer your question, but I wouldn't. So I wouldn't necessarily say that, that club soccer is always better. I would just say that um, we read it as better because of what we, the style of play that we generally tend to value in America. Um, but I think that there's often more creativity and foot skill in these, in these um, less formal spaces. And I think um, that has value too that we are that we are missing so you've had experience here what happens when somebody who's mostly familiar with the club system yeah plays with people who are do have done the small gym yeah so it's funny i i just last night um was in an environment like that so we had um, this, this coach from Como Park High School he reserved some space at the Rice Street Rec in North St. Paul and um, we had some girls who had predominantly grew, grew up playing club soccer come and we had some girls who predominantly grew up playing pickup on, you know, park fields and in, in um, city rec center gyms come. And when I talk about soccer as being kind of like a common language, it's almost like at first they're like, you know, they're speaking different, they're speaking the same language, but it's a different dialect. Um, which is cool to see. So, um, the kids who grew up playing club will be more physical on the ball and they'll be able to push the other kids off the ball a bit better. Or they'll, um, they'll read the field more like linearly, like straight up and down. Um, and they'll just want to like go more directly straight at the goal. And then the kids who grew up playing a lot of, of pickup and couldn't afford club, 
club soccer kind of thing. Um, they'll be really, really quick and tight on the ball, and they'll look for shorter passes as opposed to longer passes. But but eventually, I think they learn from each other. Um, when you see someone else do a really cool foot skill sequence, right? You can learn. You learn from that. And then when you see someone else be able to shield the ball, shield and protect the ball with their body and be pretty kind of physical, like you can learn from that. And so I think um, when those from a from a pure soccer development perspective, when those kind of players come together, um, the the cool and effective skills that shine through in a more in a more club environment, um, the kids who've played more rec pickup can learn and who can, haven't really been able to have access to that club space can learn from from the the cool skills from that environment and and the girls who've played a lot of suburban club soccer and haven't really understood or known that this world of um kind of cultural city leagues um or or rec center pickup exists they see and learn from the really cool things that these kids kids do and so even from a from a skill development perspective when you play with people who play differently than you do, um, it helps you learn, for sure. So what, what's it like as a coach? I mean, what kind, what do you do as a coach yeah. to help people adapt to this mixed world? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think um, potentially the most important thing that we do, and it's, and it, it's, I think it's pretty simple, but I think it's pretty important, is we um, try to set a tone of um, experimentation and, and joy, right? So it's, it's important that it be understood in a shared common value that it's, it's okay, and, and not only okay, but encouraged to try something new um, even if you mess up and if you mess up like you tried it and we're gonna laugh about it and then you're gonna try it again um, so for for example um, yesterday I was playing and this girl Diana who's um, you know got great foot skills um, but she's not super confident in herself, right? She she dribbled at me, she nutmegged me, which means she kicked the ball through my legs, which is like a really embarrassing thing to do to somebody, and then and then she scored. Um, and me as the coach playing in, I get to be a role model in that moment of like, how do I react, right? And so, um, you know, I fell down on the ground and I laughed about it, and then I, I cheered on Diana and I congratulated her, and then, um, and then I got the ball, and I played again, and I tried again. And so I get to model the way in that behavior as a coach. Um, and then I get to, like, be a cheerleader and supporter when other people do that as well. So creating that, like, that, like space to, to try and to find joy in the attempt, um, I think is super huge and important. Um, and then just, like picking out moments of like uh, through through like a verbal uh affirmation of like hey that thing that you did was was really cool like i love how you right so so more um the more suburban style of play where you like are really tough defensively um great pressure on the ball that was super cool that you did that um or you know more technical style of play where someone's doing a bunch of cool moves like oh that was so cool like awesome great job um, so just a lot of really cool, like, verbal confirmation and, and then, you know, some so role modeling um, where I'm embodying and, and taking on this sense of play and joy in the game myself and then, like, encouraging and, and pointing out and validating when others do that. Um, yeah. So one thing is for, for a coach to coach in this mixed environment, mm -hmm. the coach has to be familiar with and have a pretty deep appreciation of both styles of play. Yeah. Otherwise, you can't validate. I think both so. Kinds of things. I think so. Yeah, yeah. I think that that's important um, because if you're only familiar with one style of play, and if you see that one style of play as like the 
best and only way, then you're just gonna drift all of the kids toward that style. Um, and you're gonna like minimize and devalue the kids who don't play that way. But if you can recognize and validate um, all of the various unique styles of play, uh, and often, you know, style of play is is a influenced by or a product of um, culture uh, or um, or the environment that you've spent a lot of time playing in. Um, then, so if you can validate all those different unique ways, then I think you bring out, um, or you allow for, for more kids to feel validated, validated and worthy, um, and, and you, you allow for more skill to be appreciated so that, like, all of those skills can be learned. Um, and I, th I think something that I've been thinking about a lot lately is, when we think of the, the club suburban style of play as being the best and the only and the ultimate way, and, and when we try to like um, make all kids play that way, uh, I think it does devalue and minimize um, kids not from that world, right? Your, your city kids, your low-income kids, your girls of color. It minimizes the way that they play. And when we as coaches see that way of playing and of being in, within the game as less than, um, the girls internalize that and then they begin to see themselves as less than. Uh, and so for example, when we take Como Park girls um, to go play suburban high schools, they are, um, they're afraid to go there and they're afraid to play and, and they often talk about how bad they are and that they're scared and they're not good enough. Um, and some of that, like a layer of that, is some of, sometimes these suburban high schools that we go to play are, are good. They're good soccer teams, right? But I think that there's an added layer to that of like um, a sense of otherness, right? So when you look at most professional soccer players in the United States, when you look at m professional w female soccer players in the United States, when you look at most um, college soccer players in the United States, when you look at most Division I college soccer players in the United States, they are predominantly white girls. And um, girls of color, I think they know that, whether they know that consciously or, or, or more subconsciously. Um, I think that there is... I think that I've read within those girls a sense of like um, feeling their otherness and feeling the idea that I don't look like how a soccer player, a good soccer player in America is supposed to look like. Um, and connecting that dot to like the, the next jump of like, therefore I am less than um, as a player and, and like you know, when you read yourself as less than as a player, you know, I think that there's, it's an easy segue to reading yourself as less than as a person. Um, and so I think in a lot of ways, when we only value, or when we, when we hold up suburban styles of play as the ultimate styles of play, the best styles of play, um, by default, we are minimizing and devaluing uh, other styles of play that other cu cultures, other, um, you know, economic classes other girls take on and hold, and and when we devalue their styles of play, I think that in a sense we also devalue them, and I think that those girls um, can feel that and can read that, and that it influences how they think about themselves. Um, you know, so so many of the girls that I've met who live in St. Paul are are they've got fantastic skills, but they tell me all the time that they're not good at soccer. Um, that they're not good enough, and um, and it's you know it's really it's really been fascinating to hear their own takes of themselves. Mm. I'm just trying to imagine coaching. You actually get on the field and play. That's that's yeah. how you, how you coach this stuff. Yeah. So sometimes I'm sometimes I'm I'm more um, removed. I I direct from from outside of their play. Um, but sometimes I jump in and I play with, uh, and 
I think I think uh, that's important for a couple different reasons. Um, one, I kind of already touched on that idea of like I get to model the way, um, and I find a lot of joy through playing, and I I take on a really playful um, persona. Or I really I really um, kind of act kind of like I don't know kid like and celebratory through my play, um, or at least you know when I'm when I'm at my best and when I'm coaching at my best. That's how I play with the kids. Um, and I think that models the way and invites them to experience the game in the same way. Um, but I think there's also a really important element to continuing to play as a coach because then you get to um, remember and you get to feel uh, how hard it is and how, um, you know, as a soccer player, like, you're always going to make mistakes. You're always going to give the ball away to the other team. You're always going to accidentally dribble out of bounds. And so when I keep playing myself, um, I remember or, or I get to maintain that sense of, like, how hard it is. And it, and so then it, I, it, I'm not as um, quick to jump to... Um, yelling at my kids to why aren't, why aren't you playing better you need to you know this isn't good enough um or uh you know i can have a sense of like empathy when a when a player or young person is having a really hard time learning a skill because i i, I can remember um how hard that skill is to do because I, I do it um and so i think i think for me as a as a as a teacher as a coach it's it's important for me to also always maintain um a role of, of a learner um, and and so I do that through soccer I continue to play play and I t and, and experience that role of learner through soccer um, and I'm also trying to take on new things like um, I've been taking some dance classes lately I've been trying to learn dance and I'm you know certainly a beginner there and um, what else you know I've tried silly things like parkour or like ice skating and I'm just always trying to um, maintain some role of, of learner in my life so that I, I remember that it's hard to learn. Well, I'm, just, I, I'm just struck from the outside. I mean, I, I gather there are sports in which fairly advanced players just don't play with folks of the kind you're coaching. It's not possible. They, yeah. would, be, they would be crushed. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they would be injured. Yeah. It would not be fun. Yeah. Uh, it's striking that you can continue. Somebody with your experience can have fun playing yeah. with people with monstrously less experience. Right. Yeah, and that's one of my favorite things about about soccer too. Um, you know, right? So suppose if you're um, a former Division One basketball player playing up against eight year olds, <laughs> you know, you can much more easily just dunk the ball in. Um, but there, there. If if you take on um, a playful attitude toward the game, it's actually pretty easy to to mix in and play with different people from different skill set or skill levels. Skill sets or just skill levels. Um, and I actually, I think some of my own best development as a player has come from being a coach and then playing in with you know like. Uh, eight-year-olds or five-year-olds because then they're all chasing it after me and I get to I have to like use my foot skills to maneuver out of five defenders you know five eight-year-old defenders but um you know if I'm playing if I'm playing in a high school practice against girls who have much less experience and therefore skill than I do um I just try some really cool things like I try to do a rainbow which means that I flick the ball over my own head and then their head and then I get it back or I try to nutmeg them or I try a Maradona which is like a cool spin move um, or I do scoop passes which are a little bit trickier so when I'm playing against young people of or just people in general of like a lower skill level than me I just get to be um, more more creative and and I get to try new things. And again, I'm I'm gonna mess up when I try these new things. But but that allows me to model the way um, for my young people. Or or if I'm playing with with um, kids or people of lower skill level than me, um, I'll just really try to to 
set them up with passes that put them in really cool positions to score or to do good cool things or to to make moves that make them feel good about themselves um so there's always ways to play um and to push yourself and to push others um despite different skill levels